Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Brother John. Thank you. Good evening, friends. I am very happy to be here in Chicago this afternoon to, to speak to this lovely bunch of God's children. And it seems so good to stand behind the pulpit again. This has been several days. I was sitting in the room there waiting a few moments ago, and when you started singing Only Bleed, Billy looked over at me. Uh, a little tear dropped on the inside of my heart. <laughs> I don't know whether you know what I mean or not. On the inside, to hear that song again, Only Believe. And I thought that once more I go to the platform. We drove up this morning, got in just a little bit ago, and got over here. And so I, my reason of being here today, one of the reasons, is of course seeing you dear people. I always love to come to Chicago. I just feel really at home now. I don't have to say that in the this afternoon, but that's the truth. And then to get to say, to be with my brother, Jose. And uh, I heard him, he called me the other day and said, can you come up Sunday? And I said, no, I can't do it, Brother Joseph. I said, I'm just, my wife's expecting the, the little one at any time. I said, I just couldn't go. He said, well, I was going away. I'm going overseas. And said, I, I said, I'll yeah, come. <laughs> <laughs> to say goodbye or so long, we call it. Uh, in the way of preachers, we don't tell one another goodbye because we're going to live forever together. So we, <laughs> we just say so long until he goes over and wishing God's blessings and get to say so before the church here. And then, uh, thought maybe that I'd get to say before him in the church, I usually, in these healing services I have, I don't get to express myself, my feelings to people the way I want to. But I wanted to express to this church this afternoon <clears throat> in the best way that I have, which is very poorly, but my appreciation to Brother Jose, your pastor. I, as I say it like I do to my wife, I said, there's a little sweet I really love. <laughs> he, uh, he calls me Bruder Branham, and I call him Joseph, so you know, you know what kind of friends we are. And this is the boy we're going to have. His name's going to be Joseph, too. <laughs> That's right. So we, we really appreciate Brother uh, Joseph. He, not before oh, he's sitting here, that, if he would be gone, it would be better. But I have many lovely, loyal friends that I certainly esteem highly. Just coming up a few moments ago, coming up the South Shore Drive, I guess you call that over there, what Billy and I were talking. And he said, you going back tonight, Dad? I said, I'll be too tired. Billy, I said, I'll preach twice to get today. And I said, it'll be, I'll be too tired. He said, you know what? But I think that Brother Bose is one of the, one of the finest fellows that I've ever met. I'll say it for the words of my boy, these boys. <laughs> That's right. I have learned to love Brother Joseph. Here's what I like about him. Many things. First, being a Christian brother. Second, you can depend on what he says. I like it. I like a man that when he tells you anything, you stand by. Another thing is this. He's my friend whether I'm right or wrong. Now, anybody can be your friend while you're right. But when you're in the wrong, then he's still your friend. Now, it's not all times that I'm right, you know. The biggest part of the time, I'm perhaps wrong. But whether I'm wrong or right, Joseph Jose is my friend. I've seen him in the hard trials. I've seen him in the times where the public knows nothing about, when we come up against testing times. He's always stood to my side like a brother. And I appreciate that very much. I've certainly been, people try to discourage me, says, Brother Joseph is a Latter-day Saint or Latter-day <laughs> what is it? Latter day rain? I said, I don't care if he's first, second, latter, or all between. <laughs> he's my brother. <laughs> Our coming together, a meeting was once I canceled in Chicago, Illinois, as an attempt meeting because they not never seen him in my life. I canceled the tent meeting on account they wouldn't invite Brother Joseph to meet You all don't know that. But that's true. I just returned from Stockholm, Sweden. And uh, the group that was with me said, that, uh, I said, is this the full cooperation of all churches? Yes. And I said, uh, that little fellow that uh, they talk up there, what's that uh, Swedish church over there, Brother Peter's new? I said, is he uh, cooperating? Well, the fellow that was talking to me said, no, you see, Brother Bram, 
it would uh, it would hurt your meeting, he said, because he's a Latter-day Rain. I said, if he can't be there, I can't either. So, I said, if we're interdenomination, that means everybody, I don't care who it is, if it's Methodist, Baptist, Jehovah Witness, whatever it is, they're going to be there just the same. And we can't draw straws and say, this fellow has no right, because we're perfectly brethren together, and that's the way we want to remain that way. So no matter what church they go to, uh, we're all brothers in Christ, and that's when we're born again as a kid. And um, I appreciate Brother Joseph with all my heart. And then I just imagine, this is not said to me, and I, I have nothing pre-thinking, but I just imagine when he was talking to me there, that before he left, knowing that he's a poor man, just lives for the arms of the people like I do, that before going, they'd probably take a love offering for the man before going over. I wish I was able to do that. I asked him a few moments ago, I said, Brother Joseph, will you be taking up a love offering for yourself? He said, perhaps so, Brother Branham, tonight you'll probably... I said, I wish I could take it for you, brother, but I said, you'd go broke if I did. But I said, I, I just like, you've never heard me say, mention them things in the, up on the platform because I've never took an offering in my life. A brother or anything that I could do to help that man along, I'd do it because I'll tell you why. When I was in tight place, you all know nothing about it. You done it. I was here one time going overseas and making arrangements and ready to go. Like in two thousand dollars and having enough to pay for the tickets. That's right. Enough to pay for the tickets, but by faith God had called me and I was going. And Joseph, by inspiration, I never told him, but by inspiration, he walked down and, and stuck that up with the people, not no strange things that he's going overseas, he needs money to go on or something on that order, and tuck that offering up out of Chicago. By faith we did it. I bought the tickets the next day and left. <laughs> I wanted to say that him going over to everything to him tonight, may the good Lord bless him real good and sunny. I'm, maybe you've never been in this part of the country before, have you, Brother Joseph, where you're going? No. He just doesn't realize what he's facing you. <laughs> <laughs> so I know it's a hard thing when you get into Africa. I pray that God will be with my brother and bless him in everything he may win souls to Christ over there. And I hope that the good Lord makes it possible that he can just will have the most successful meeting he ever had in all these lives, right. and return back to Chicago freshly and so forth and ready to bring the news back to you people of a great revival. This will make him a missionary yeah. when he goes this time. I know that kind of sounds a little strange to you people in other churches. Listen, you, a missionary is not a person who changes his nation to live. Right. A missionary is a person that goes and comes back. Paul was the greatest missionary the world ever knew. Is that right? If you just train a man and send him over there and make his home there and stays all his life, he just changes his nation. Hey, isn't a missionary? A missionary is from one place to another place and to another place. Because Paul went all the way around and come back and go out again and all the way around and come back. So Paul was a missionary. Brother Joseph, may God bring right. you back safely as a missionary. Hallelujah. bring you back again. The Lord bless you. And to you dear people here in Chicago, I was going to ask maybe... Is there any sick among us today? If there is, raise up your hand. Somebody for maybe you had prayer meeting tonight. Pray, pray for the sick. If you like a prayer for the sick tonight, raise up your hands. Everybody would like a meeting. Pray. Well, fine. That's good. Then we'll be praying for the sick tonight. I'll leave some cards here for them to give out along about 6.30, something like that. And you come down and get your prayer card and we'll six pray for the sick. Six o'clock? Six yeah, all right. It's six o'clock then tonight. That'll be fine. All right. Now, the first thing if Billy Paul's in here and I mean search in the car and see if he got any prayer cards. Have have you got some? He's got something to make some out of. If yeah. All right. Okay, that'll be fine. All right, and tonight we'll we'll be praying for the sick. Now this afternoon, it's getting late and we'll just never get started. You know how we are kind of slow to get started and slow to stop. <laughs> But I, I just love to come up here and talk to you, dear people. And will you be praying for my beloved wife? Will yeah. you do that for the little fellow that's coming on? Poor little woman. She's just certainly having a time. And we're looking to him who's the invisible one yeah. for deliverance. Now, 
in the book of St. John, I'd like to read just a few words and speak to you for a few moments and... and uh, Oh, yes, sir. Thank you, brother. And now we will try to get away in about 30 minutes, if the Lord is willing. I want to speak to you today. Let's read some of the scriptures. And uh, St. John, or not St. John, 1 John, the first chapter. Now, I see they're down here, my friends Leo and Jean, a couple of boys in your neighborhood here, takes recordings. And say, by the way, these boys go to all the meetings and takes recordings. And um, they have them on tape. I sent for a tape to somebody who preached the sermon the other day, and I sent for a tape. My, I thought I was going to have to buy the whole country to get the tape. <laughs> about $9 for a tape. I thought, oh, my. I questioned these boys. I said, what about this? Oh, my, I thought a difference it wasn't what they had. And they had every message and so forth. They're all fast, fast, cornbread fed, but it'll do you good. <laughs> it'll help you a whole lot. Brought me safe this far, I'm ready to take it. I've trusted in the very shadows of death, this old-time religion that saved me. It might not be just polished up like it should be, but I want the blessings of God with me regardless of how polished it is. And, um, and the Lord bless these two boys. They just give their life for that purpose in their, in their work. Now, we are begin to read with the fifth verse, just to, uh, down including the seventh verse. This, then, is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie, and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Isn't that beautiful? Now, shall we bow our heads just a moment? Our Heavenly Father, speaking today to this lovely audience of eternity-bound people, perhaps the most of them already washed in the blood of the Lamb, made their robes white, clean, forgiven of all their sins and their trespasses, and are waiting for their summons for on high. And we come to speak and to have this little fellowship together with our brother before leaving for the overseas to fulfill the great commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Bless our dear beloved brother, Lord in his mission. Bless the little church that waits now for him to return, waiting in prayer for their beloved pastor. Bless his assistant that will take the place of all the elders and the people. Bless the reading of the scripture, and now give us fellowship with thee just now around the word while we ask it in his name. Amen. Now speaking on the word and the word of fellowship thinking coming up there it might be a marvelous time to speak just on fellowship for a few moments. That's one of the greatest things. Everyone desires fellowship. People today, they'll say, will you just come over with me over the house a little while? Let's have just a little time of fellowship. Then many times a businessman will say, will you have a lunch with me today at dinner? Uh, go out and just uh, have a little lunch together, eat a piece of pie or something, a time of fellowship, eating. Eating goes with fellowship. And while we're talking this afternoon, may the Holy Spirit of God take the Word of God and feed every hungry soul Amen. in there. Yes, eating accompanies fellowship. And man shall not live by bread alone, saith the Lord, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The Holy Spirit then likes to eat and fellowship with the believer. What a time! We're all gathered around a great table now. For the good things of God is just piled up high. God's got in his 
bounties of blessings, everything that we have need of, all the vitamins, everything that we have need of to make us full, dirty, healthy Christians, filled with his spirit, washed in his blood. And what a time that we can fellowship. And did you ever think the old proverb that man has once said, my mother used to use this much, birds of a feather flock together. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> you watch them. You won't see doves and scavengers together because they can't eat the same diet. A scavenger, a buzzard, he can just eat anything. A crow can sit out there on a dead carcass and eat. A dove couldn't do it. If she'd eat it, it would kill her. She just can't eat it. She gets over in a wheat field and begins to eat in the wheat. She associates with her own kind. But here's the startling part. Did you know the crow can eat on the dead carcass and also eat wheat? He can eat both. See? So you have to watch them fellows. <laughs> that type. That can sit in the meeting and pertain to enjoy the meeting and go back out and take the things of the world. That's the way social believers are today. But we like to congregate ourselves together with those who separate themselves from the things of the world called out and been made new creatures in Christ Jesus and fellowship and around the blessings of the Holy Spirit. What a marvelous thing. Now, man was born to have fellowship. Man in the beginning, back in the Garden of Eden, he had wonderful fellowship. God come down and fellowship with his company of men and women every evening. In the cool of the evening, God would come down under the great palm trees Perhaps the sacred light as it was shining down in Adam and Eve in that great cathedral in the open. Fellowship with God had nothing to worry about as long as they were fellowshipping. I love fellowship with man. I like to go out and call for people who love the Lord and have fellowship with them because we see the same thing. Our motives are the same. Our ideals are the same. I like to talk to people on the... I've got a friend sitting right down here that likes to hunt and fish. Many times we have a lot of fellowship together, just sitting around talking on those things because we like those things. Now, but the greatest fellowship that any man ever had was when he had fellowship with God. When God had gave himself open to man to fellowship back and forth with his creature, the creator and his creature. Now, when God was fellowshipping with Adam in the Garden of Eden, Adam had nothing to worry about. Everything was on the smooth and running, right. He didn't have to worry about his clothes. He didn't have to worry about something to eat. He didn't have to worry about sickness. He didn't have to worry about death, sorrow. He knew nothing about them, just the freedom like a child. He had a Heavenly Father who watched over him and fellowship with him daily, wouldn't it be marvelous if we could be back like that again? Yeah. And do you know every redeemed soul today that's living under their privileges of that kind of fellowship with God? you believe that? Yeah. God will take care and provide everything that we have need of in this journey. And at the end of the close of this old mortal tabernacle, God promised to give us another one. Amen. 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 You know, I have a little funny idea about when we die. I might as well express it. I'm at home. Brother Joseph said one time, I was going to answer a woman's question. It might be a little contrary. He said, Brother Branham, I said, My Brother Joseph, here's what I want to say. And uh, he said, Look, don't say it. He said, When we wrote the... Uh, our rules and what we believe in this church, we end with a comma, not a period. We believe this plus as much more as we can hear. So that's very good. I like that. Now, when John 14, when he said, In my Father's house is many mentioned, speaking to his disciples before going away, I can't imagine that being a stone and bricks and mortar. I believe the tabernacle he is speaking of was another body to live in. In my Father's house is many tabernacles are mentioned. Destroy this tabernacle and I'll raise up in three days. And again, 
If this earthly tabernacle be dissolved, we have one already prepared and waiting. See? But I believe that when we are spending a few days to go on Mount Wilson, Tom, or other out there in California, of that great observatory where it's the 120 million years of light space, and they were timing and how science gets turned around in their theology. I tell you, when I went to school and listened to that science, I tell you, there's nothing like I was taught in school. You know, my daddy used to sit down and he said to the Bible, he said, Billy, how in the world can... I said, Dad, the sun stands perfectly still, scientific proof, and the world turns around us. He said, Joshua said he stopped the sun. I said, how are you going to do that? I said, Daddy, we were taught it in school. And I said, they are scientifically proven. And he said, well, maybe they have it. That ain't my kind of science, he said. He believed, said, Joshua, and I asked the Bible teacher at school. He said, well, of course, you know, Joshua, that people in that day were ignorant, and God just looked at his ignorance, and he stopped the world and said, but now they have to take that back. The sun does the running. The sun turns to they scientifically proven it. The sun turns. When I was a boy going to school, he said when the sun goes down, it shows the light over on the stars, and then the stars, that reflects the light of the sun. Now the scientific proof that can't be so. It takes a billions and billions of years for the sun, light traveling so many million miles per hour, or whatever it is, traveling from the sun to get to one of the stars. So it isn't a star, it makes its own light now. Brother Moore's boy graduated and one of the great scientists come here a few weeks ago and embraced him and gave him his scholarship. He said, in Washington, D.C., there's 124 latest scientist books on all the modern science that's scientifically proven. He said, young man, it takes you two years to read through that book. And as you read, read through them, you'd have to discard everything you learned because it'd be something different. <laughs> and while he said that, I squeaked down a little... Amen. Back right there. But I thought I could stand and say this, but I've got a book here that ages will turn on and on and on. You'll never have to compromise. Yeah. Yeah. It'll always be the same yeah. because it's inspired. They have to come back to it every time. Oh, don't try to learn. Make your hair green trying to study science. Just study God's Bible because it's the pure book of all. Then I think that whenever this soul leaves the body, we go into another house not made of hands. We go in the presence of God and there tabernacle with Him in the presence of the Lord Jesus. And that is omnipotent, uh, I mean omnipotent, omnipresent. And then if He is, we are when we go into our new tabernacle over there. And then... If he said, wherever two or three are gathered together, I'll be in their midst. Then he's bound to be here this afternoon, just as sure as there's a, a heaven and an earth. Jesus Christ is present now. Yes. But what it is, he's in an unseen condition. We can't see him, but there's something about the Christian soul. That when man realizes when his presence is there, he's standing in the presence of something that he can't see. We are know that there's radio going through here now, there's television going through here now. I can't pick it up, but it's in another world. And so is the angels of God placed around in this room watching this afternoon. The angels of God are encamped about those who fear him. Jesus is all, all present, all the time, watching right. over us. Yeah, Lord. And we know that that's to be the truth. Yeah. I think of one Elijah down there at Dothan. One of the guys went out and looked over and said, Oh, the whole Syrian army, look at them. We've done got this city compassed about. And we're surrounded. Elijah said, There's more with us than there is with them. Yeah. He said, Well, I couldn't see nobody. He said, God opened this boy's eyes. Mm -hmm. And when his eyes come open, the mountains are on fire and angels are fire, church of fire. <laughs> Sure, he's here. Amen. And when Christian believers can believe that present now, right now, sitting together, seated here in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, fellowshipping, amen, around the Word of God, the Holy Spirit, here, 
taking the word of God, God's agent, moving it out into every heart like that, as the word is going forth and every believer receiving it, oh, if we would stand and claim our God-given privileges, and that's time that God can ever take that wishbone out of a person's back and put a real old-fashioned gospel backbone in it. <laughs> Somebody who will stand for truth. And no matter how dark it looks, God let the Hebrew firm walk right into the fire furnace before he ever turned a hand. He's always there. Don't be scared. He's always <laughs> present. Uh, Amen. <laughs> and if the footsteps of a righteous man is all of the Lord, what we got to fear? God be for you. Who can be against and, you? Yeah. Oh, my. Think of all the dynamic forces of heaven gathers together in a meeting. Amen. Just trying to find an outlet is the Holy Spirit taking the word and pounding the word like a air hammer against the rock. Yeah. Oh, my. Break up our stony hearts and move away the belief and unbelief and fellowship uh, around the word. Fellowship is wonderful. When Adam and Eve separated themselves from God by sin, separated them, they become a wonder and no fellowship. Wandering about, weakening down. That's what's the matter with man today. Sin has separated man from that type of fellowship. Today we wonder how we're going to do this and wonder how we're going to do that. Jesus said the heathens seek after such things. How we, what we shall eat or how we shall be clothed or what will we do with this or the other. After all those things, he says, the Gentiles, the unbelievers see. Yeah. But your yeah. heavenly Father knows what you have to eat of even before you yeah. ask him. Yeah. What a carefree condition. Yeah. <laughs> Why, well, I got a little old brown-eyed girl down there. Why, well, she jump off the fence down there. Anything, she don't care as long as I'm standing there. She yeah. said, Daddy, pick me up. Okay. <laughs> She's just carefree. I thought, oh, God, if I could just be like that. Just and, carefree. Yeah. A few days ago, Brother Joseph encouraged me a lot. I've seen a lot of stuff rising up in the churches that should not be. And, oh, I, the Irishman, you know, I had to go out and stop it all myself. And I, I'd go to God and say, this can't be like this and this can't be like that. Can't do it because you go to small God program. You're getting stuff in there that shouldn't be in all this. And I knew it was wrong. It's scripturally wrong. And I'm the first thing, you know, I begin to find myself getting a little kind of off the line, getting bitter. Uh, I stopped out there on the ramp, begin to pray, and Joseph come down. He said, look, I just read the history of Martin Luther. And the question was that they didn't wonder about Martin Luther able to protest the Catholic Church and get by with it. But what the wonder was that Martin Luther is all the fanaticism that followed it, and he right. raised up out of all of it. That's, right. That's the main thing. Then I heard this was, as Christ said, what is that disease? Follow me. Right. I'll take care of the rest of it. You just go ahead and follow me. Yeah. That's the way it is. Yeah. Then get back to the carefree again. All right, when man separates himself from God, he becomes a wanderer, wandering about everywhere. And what a picture that is of today. When man really gets out of fellowship with God, this week he's a Methodist, the next week he's a Baptist, and then he's this and that and the other, wandering about, tossed about by every wind of doctrine. The heart ought to be established. I don't say you should be Methodist, Baptist, or whatever. You ought to be right with God. There, no matter what church you go to, what group you fellowship with, any group of whether it's the assemblies or the oneness or the two-ness or the latter-day reigns or whatever it is, just as long as your fellowship is clean with God. The Bible said we, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And then we have fellowship one with another. Yes. Amen. I love that. Oh, my. The way then God seeing that man out of fellowship, man, he must do something to restore his creature back to where he could get his heart again, where he could get his, his way back. Now, there's where the sad part, part starts right now. Now, man has tried to substitute something for that fellowship ever since the beginning of time. Right. Right. Now, today, we say, sure, 
Everybody come join our church. We have it. The Methodist wants to believe that on there is the Baptist on there is the Catholic on there is the Presbyterian on there is Pentecostal on there is the Apostolic on there. And in that they form the Declaration of Creeds. And they have this church set up and a bunch of creeds. Yep. And around that they claim that that is the way to have fellowship. Yep. Listen, you can't have fellowship that way. You can join every church there is in the country and still be out of fellowship with Christ. God laid down the only plan back there in the beginning when he slew a lamb, a sheep, and brought out the welcome mat for the human race to come back to fellowship, and that was through the blood. Amen. Now you hear so little about the blood today. We're always speaking about other things. We're speaking about the times and about the atomic bombs. Those things are all right. But, brother, to me, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And when the blood's been properly applied, sin is done away with. And man is back in fellowship with God. Amen. Amen. What we need today is a good old-fashioned blood bomb. Revival. <laughs> Amen. Life lays in the blood stream. Yeah. And when the blood of Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness, then we have fellowship with God. Yeah. You can repent or come up and make a confession, go on six months probation, be sprinkled out of the salt shaker and belong to the Methodist Church. Yes, sir, and have fellowship with every one of them. Right. Or you can come up to the Baptist church and get the right hand of fellowship and make a confession and be baptized in water. Have fellowship with the Baptist church. Let me tell you, in the Pentecostal church you can pray a little while till you speak with tongues and have fellowship with every one of them. Huh? But my brother and sister, until your soul's been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, you'll never have fellowship with right. him. Yeah. Right. And when... Your soul has been washed in the blood of the Lamb. All malice, hatred, in strife, all these things have died. The blood makes an atonement. Right. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. That's the reason today in our Pentecostal fellowships, in our different full gospel fellowships, we have so much carrying on, so much chasm and stuff in our bodies because our, our, our different isms and things that it has set in. It's because that one will pull out and be this, and another pull out and be this, and one will pull out and start a, a denomination or an organization. The very reason that is because the person's heart wasn't right with God to start with. God wants us all as one body. One body of believers baptized in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, my. God laid out one mat to meet people on. That was the welcome mat. From the once fallen fellowship, the restoration back is the blood. Do the blood. You have fellowship. Restoration to fellowship with God. Adam could not meet upon his own theology. He sold fig leaves around himself, but it wouldn't work. He made his own organization, he made his own denomination, but it wouldn't work. And today... Oh, when I drove up around the side of your nudist colony down here, it's on the road up here, they can't even wait until they until the sun gets hot. Uh, Laying stripped out on the beach down there, men and women together look like a bunch of I don't know what. And every one of them have thrown into some church somewhere, saying a few prayers over beads or singing a doxology somewhere, maybe in choirs and lay out like that. It shows that something has let down. More be sensible people won't act like that. Brother, that's true. If you ever get a touch of Christ in your heart, you're spoiled in such places. Amen. Now, I don't have my disagree, might disagree with that, but you get down that heart one time right and see what God will do about it. I tell you, even my poor little girl, she ain't but two years old, walked out in the room there, out in the other day, out in the yard, and there was a woman out there mowing grass with a uh, little uh, uh, clothes on, look horrible. And that two-year-old child come in and said, Oh, Daddy, that lady forgot her skirt. <laughs> now there you are. You see, a baby knows better, but when men and women let their hearts become seared, it's demons. Hours of the devil. There never was but one thing in all the ages. Sick man in that 
that was devil. Sick women and others. That's exactly the man either one. It looks like a bunch of prehistoric animals. They ain't skipped out to have no conscience. The Bible said they'd have their conscience seared with a hard eye. And them same people, this one I'm speaking of, in particular, I know now are saints in a choir. Oh, my! They got fellowship with their group. Say, the fellowship of Christ. Yes, sir. I know that's strong, brother and sister, but God help us if the Pentecostal church don't get back to the blood of Christ again. Uh, uh, right. Right. Get back. It used to be a, a sin a long time ago for Pentecostal people to act like that. They didn't do it a long time ago, but they do it too now. Is because the prophets get loose. You begin to think about you belong to this church, a denomination, or something other like that. You better have fellowship again. Amen. Amen. Yeah. 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 Going to be a horrible thing one of these days. One of the disappointments of judgment. The bootlegger ain't going to be. He knows what his doom is. The lie and the thief, they know what their doom is when they stand before God. But when the disappointment comes, is those who belong to Pentecostal churches. Will be turned away to one side for they know better and willfully walk into it. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. What we need today is a good old fashioned shaking revival. Amen. Let's get back to its place again under the foot of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Under fellowship. It's been the means of approach always down to the age, down to people. Watch it down along God's only way of us. The oldest book in the Bible is Job. And Job approached God and had fellowship with God through the shed blood. Job offered a lamb each time when he went to fellowship. The worshipers of the Old Testament all the way through from Genesis, come on over to the New Testament. Every time they go to have fellowship with God, they make a burnt offering. Yeah. For the lamb first because they're approaching under the blood. Job when he was approached God, he'd kill a lamb. That's the oldest book in the Bible. It was wrote before Genesis was written. Moses wrote Genesis. Now, hundreds of years later, but notice, Job was the oldest book, and all the way from Eden, Job would make a sacrifice, pour out the blood of the lamb, and through that blood he would confess his wrong. Say, uh, God, be merciful to me now. And I approach thee to the blood. You know why people ain't getting their prayer answered the way they should? They're coming in a psychological workup instead of by the way of the blood. That's right. Right. Yeah. Come by the blood, dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power. For all the handsome church of God be saved to sin no more. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we got to come to the shed blood. And there Job offered the shed blood as he approached Jehovah, knowing that God would receive him not upon nothing else. If you approach him today in the name of a good man, I pay my debts, I don't cheat the government, I pay my income tax, I do all these things, I'm a good neighbor. Your yeah, God will never hear you. That's right. If you say, I'm a royal church member, I tithe my money, I gave great offerings into the church, I'm the pillar. God will never receive you. That's right. Never. That's right. Not at all. You say, well, my mother was a good woman, my father was a good man, my grandfather was a preacher, all down to, and I've never did this, I've never steal, I've never drink, I've never smoke, I've never lie, I've never do these things. God will never hear you. That's right. And no matter who you are, how bad you've been if you'll come God's provided way hey. through the sacrificial blood, yeah. taking and laying your hand upon the head of the dead lamb yeah. or the dying lamb and confess your wrong and accept him, then God will kill your soul with the Holy Spirit, yeah. burning out all the iniquity and carnality and making you a new creature. Yeah. Job, I think about Job in that day as a dad. He had a bunch of children. They were kind of wayward. And he was always thinking of his children. Wouldn't it be a lot better if all the church members of Chicago had that same kind of idea about their kiddies? 
You wouldn't have no juvenile delinquency. That's right. You wouldn't see these race rots, and I mean these uh, rots and things they have around here today. No. Shooting, killing, stealing, rape, and all these things is because the people are unconcerned about their children. That's right. The first thing they say, well, I'll put them on the trail here when they will we'll turn the rest of it over to the Sunday school teacher and her out of a dance maybe all night, come in, fixed up like some kind, just going to a circus instead of a church, yeah. and put your children in the hands of something like that. Mother, shame on you. You ought yeah. to put that child at your knee down there and read the Bible. Lay yeah. your hands over on the head. Yeah. Call out to God. God be merciful. Yeah. Bear my daughter, my son. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. I love to do it. Take them little girls of mine. And they're sitting down there and they're sitting in their eyes, listening out. Our little ears listening to their eyes, looking on. I tell them about all about Jesus and how he loves them. And then they'll kneel right around the chairs and pray just like the rest of us. That's the way we want to do it, isn't it? Yeah. That's the way many of you do it. That's what you should do. I went into a many home, and the children are all gathered around for family prayer always. God bless that family. Amen. That's the tie that binds. Yes, sir. If you did that at your home, there wouldn't be so many divorce cases and things going on the way there is. You'd have fellowship with each other. And I see Joel, his children got married and went out to different ways as they do like birds from a nest. Joel knowing that there was no other way, not a possible way, that man could ever approach God and have fellowship with him only through the sacrificial lamb, through the blood. Job said, Prevent you, my children might have sinned. So I'll offer a lamb for them. Something told Job he better make it ready. He better be ready. And then when he made the offering of the sacrificial lamb for his children, one day it happened. The storms come and kill the lot of them and fire and so forth and destruction. But before this happened, Job made sure that he one was under the blood. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. Rejection, turning down today. This nation is Christ killing as fast as it can, grieving away the Holy Spirit with creeds and forms of religion. Yes. Grieving the Holy Spirit. I was reading out long ago, I heard somewhere on oh, this great Adventist Billy Graham when he was in Scotland. You know what's the matter? If the Pentecostal people had kept their heads together instead of breaking out and making everything like you did, your services would be going on like the Baptists, but the Baptists took it away from you. That's right. They're having a revival going somewhere because they threw everything they were on the head their, their prophet and away they went. They stick behind him. But today, that one way that the same reason all uh, the about 7,000, I had about 7,000, and on the outside, he had about 3,000. That's wrong. So when I went over to see him, I thought some little boy stand up like a uh, little lion, nursery lion, Jesus, he had a baby born in a manger. But when I seen that little boy, uh, it was different. That little fellow was just about that high. I didn't even know it was a little baby. He threw off his coat, took a text, and preached like a preacher. I mean, God was with him. I said, there's a little boy that God sent. Now, if you church pappies will get around him, not let him get puffed up in his head and let him go to run over the bunch of money and get around him and put the right in for it, and he'll save thousands of little children. Uh, but I stand up there in, in uh, Oregon, Grants Pass, Oregon, one morning before Brother Hall and him, I said, what? It won't work. I said to some of the group, I said, what about getting little Dave now to come into a city like that and do this? Well, I said, he's the one. I said, I don't care what he is. God's with him. Well, of course, now the assemblies had to get them a little David. And the church of God got them a little David. And the first thing you know, there's thousands of little David. The very principle of God was trying to get to the children, they tore the thing down. Don't know their day. The ox knows his master's crib and the mule knows his stall, but my people knows not, said God. That's right, they don't know the day of their visitation. It's the funniest thing, the try or strangest thing, to get God's people to see the day of the visitation. They just certainly begin to pull around something, other personalities or something, and don't know how to handle it. Move their fellowship into a 
denomination instead of into Christ. And when Job seen what he had done then, how that he had offered that sacrifice, the Bible said that his children was gathered with him. Now, making preparations. Another thought, Israel. When they had fellowship, notice what they did. Before the great destruction came, the angel that destroyed the lands of destroying angels, the first thing taking place, Israel was commanded to take a lamb and kill it and put the blood on the door and every family go in and eat that lamb. Yes, yes. Fellowship mm-hmm. around the roasted lamb. Eat the body of the dead sacrifice that died in their stead. God said, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. The death angel could not touch them because the blood of the Lamb was over the door and they were in your having communion, yes. fellowshipping around the Lamb. That's where it is in our heart when we apply the blood of the Lord Jesus taking away all sin. Yes. Then we can have fellowship uh-huh. eating the Word of God around yes. the table of God, fellowshipping upon the godly things. You preach divine healing, every one of them in Christ said, Amen, that's right. Preach that we should lay aside all sin, malice, strife, and things. Amen, says the true believer, that's right. Fellowshipping around the Word. See what I mean? Now, now, always the only place that God has ever met, said that He had ever meet man, He never promised to meet us in denomination. He never promised to meet us in any other way but through the shed blood. Yeah. Israel of the Old Testament, no matter where they was, they, before they worshiped God, they come to a common meeting place, which was the tabernacle in the wilderness. Of a man was over the top of the hill and he wanted to fellowship with God, he come into the tabernacle in the wilderness there to meet God. Moses and Miriam and Smith with leprosy went in and fell before God under the shed blood. Mm-hmm. That's See? Right. That's right. Positionally, place yourself now for tonight. See? Get under the blood. Oh, these pains that's in your heart, get them out. Yes. Go before God under the blood. Yes. Confessing your wrongs and call and make it right. Mm-hmm. Help me. Moses got to answer the prayer right away because he went God's way under yeah. the blood. Yeah. Before he could have fellowship, he went in under the blood. Now notice, the lamb was slain. Back in the Old Testament, they had a red heifer. So Moses, when they started their journey, said, I make a provision for the cleansiness of the people as they journey on. For if they do do wrong, they're out of fellowship. And before they can fellowship, I want you to make a water of separation for them. And then Moses was commanded to take a red heifer, a young heifer. Now I want you to notice the word red means something. To you and I, red means danger. But red in the Bible means redemption. Redemption through the blood all the way from Genesis to Revelation is a red streak of blood all the way through. Red all the way. Notice, they had to come under the shed blood. Now, I said, take a red heifer. Now, did you ever notice scientifically? You take something real red and look through red, too red, and it looks white. Did you ever know that? Red, too red, looks white. And so God, knowing that man was a sinner by nature, knowing that he was wrong to begin with, he made a preparation to shed blood, and God, looking through the blood of the Lord Jesus, sees you a red sinner, white as snow. You have no more sin. Amen. When yeah. God looks through the blood of Christ, Amen. no matter what you've done, how much sin you've committed, what you've done, if the blood of Christ has been applied to your heart, God sees you perfect. Yeah. Listen, I'll tell you a little secret in a few minutes about divine healing and about things. First thing, friends, is the preparation of the human heart. Yes, sir. Here a few days ago, I was up here in Chicago. The old science used to say, man thinketh with his heart. Nonsense. The Bible's wrong. 
There's no mental faculties in the heart to think with. Man thinks with his head, with his mind. But now they find out God was right. <laughs> See? Man doesn't think with his head, his mind. He has a, he's a dual personality. Look, person, in here first is, is, is le- intellectual. But they say that in the human heart, it isn't in an animal heart, it isn't in any other heart. But right in the human heart is a little compartment in the middle of the human heart that doesn't even have a blood cell in it. That it's the occupation of the soul. So man really thinks with his heart, not with his head. Now, if you think that's what's the matter, we've got so many lukewarm church members today. People have intellectual faith. They'll sympathize and say, oh, the Bible's right, sure, oh, yeah. yes, sir. Oh, yeah. See? Yeah. They have intellectual faith. Oh, I believe the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I'll chuck his personal Savior, smoke cigarettes, drink whiskey, go on out and go to dances, lay on these beaches and things around here. Sure, Christ is my Savior. Oh, sure, certainly I belong to the church. That's intellectual faith. Many people have come into the prayer line and say, Oh, brother, I got faith, sure. It's intellectual faith. It. But when that intellectual faith becomes down into this little compartment here, it becomes positive. Hey. Oh, there is a hell of a thing Right. It. Yeah. When it comes down there, the sin question settles. Amen. Yeah. When he say, Hey, I'm the Lord that healeth thee. When yeah. that comes through the intellectual faith, Drop down into that little compartment in the doctors in Chicago day you'll die. <laughs> no, sir. No, indeed. Hey, it's really good. That's what God does. He moves out in and takes that intellectual faith and speaks it down into the human heart. And when it comes into the heart, it becomes a positive hey. factor that hey. God himself moves into the human heart and makes that a positive fact. Yeah. Amen. Hey, when that faith comes out of the mind into the human heart. Now, you see what I mean? Now, under the shed blood, he said, take that heifer three years old, and she must be red. And to take her out here, the first thing, she must never have a yoke on her neck. Oh, I just love that. Yeah. Now, listen, this might burn and scorch and sizzle, but it's better to do it just for a little while than to do it forever. That's right. Yeah. That, that, that heifer represented Christ. And Christ has not yoked up with anything. That's right. Amen. But God alone. Now, be not equally unequally yoked up with unbelievers. Go out here and this and that and dilly-dallying around yoking yourself up in these parties and dances and things. Keep yourself away from it. Get yeah. yourself with Christ. Yeah. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Yeah. This heifer cannot have a yoke upon her. She must be without any yoke on her. And then she must be killed in the presence of the high priest. And then when the high priest Aaron seen that the heifer was killed, Eliezer taken blood and on his fingers and went and slapped it on the door seven times, up on the door of the tabernacle, a public testimony. Yeah. Then the heifer was taken and put in the fire and burned, burned up, and then was tucked out outside the court, Notice beautifully, got a hurry. Outside the court, this was laid up in a clean place, for it was the waters of separation. In Ephesians, Paul said over there that God, by the preaching of the word, the waters of separation, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word. And the word of God is the waters of separation. What's by renewing by the water, by the word? Hearing the word separates us. Now the unbeliever, all the man's sin was outside. Here's a little point we don't want to pass, that the water of separation must be kept in a clean place. And the preacher that preaches the gospel should be a clean, upright man. Not a cigarette fiend. Not a dope addict. No. Not a drunkard or a golf player on Sunday afternoon and so forth like that. No, it must be kept in a clean, sanctified, holy vessel. Yes. The one that holds the mystery of God in yes. his heart. Yes, sir. And it must be in a clean church. Not when they play bingo in the basement. Mm-hmm. Lottery. Have soup suppers out there and dances for the young folks. Well, brother, if it ever gets to a place I have to do that to hold an audience, I'll quit and take me a bunch of traps and go up and candles and go to traps. Yeah, yeah. Amen! Mm. I'd love 
better do it than to know that I'd compromised upon the pure, unadulterated gospel of the Lord Jesus. Give me fellowship with him. Amen. Preach the word. You don't have to have all this nonsense. Keep with the word. And the word separates sinners from their sins. Then every man out of fellowship come up first to the waters of separation at the congregation. And he was sprinkled with these waters. Now, what was it? The water spoke of a dead sacrifice that went on before him. Yes. The dead heifer died in his place. And when we preach the word, it is known in any denomination, it's on Christ. Yes. The sacrifice yes. he died in your stead. Yes. Right. Yes. You're out of fellowship. Can't get prayer answered. Everything's black around you. Out of fellowship. Come back to the word now. The word goes to cutting. Separate you. Well, you ought to do this. You ought to do that. This is here. You don't have fellowship no more. You've got yourself out of communion. That's the waters of separation. Tells you what you should do. Then the first thing you know, the believer, after doing that, the next thing he did, he walked forward then. He's coming in, the believer now. He's walking forward. When he comes next to the door, he looks and he sees seven stripes of blood, which means that blood went before him. Now he comes under those seven stripes of blood in under the blood and then he has fellowship. Right. Yes. You see it? Yes. Fellowship with God. No fellowship nowhere else. And that whole thing in the tabernacle, in the justification of the court, sanctification at the altar, the Holy Spirit behind the veil, what moved in and let down, all a picture of Christ no matter how much they organize, Korah organized the organization, said there's no holy man in Moses, so we just thought God said, separate yourself from me <laughs> right now because he's broke the program of God. Yeah. See? Fellowship is only one place that's under the shed blood. Hey. Now listen to yeah. this closely. Look, there is no fellowship outside of the body of Jesus Christ. Right. You can't have fellowship mm-hmm. with God. No wonder people don't believe in divine healing. No wonder they can't believe in an old-fashioned god sent revival. Yeah. No wonder they can't believe in these things that cleans a man's heart. You've got to come in first to the fellowship before you ever understand these Amen. things. Yeah. Come in. Hear the word. Separate you. Washes you. Then come out of the blood into the body of Christ, which the tabernacle was a perfect type of Christ. Amen. Tear this building down, I'll build it up in three days again. See? He was, and then by one spirit, we were all led by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ, and then come out of the blood, all the sin questions settled on the outside through the preaching of the word, through the sacrifice of the, of the lamb at the altar, and now we're into fellowship with Christ, and we can come in and commune with the rest of them, those who are inside the building in Christ, we come in, you once called him a holy roar, once you said he's crazy, he's lost his mind, but whenever you once come out of the shed blood and had fellowship, you walk over that man that you once thought screamed too loud, that woman you heard shouting that night, that neighbor that you talked about it come told you about divine healing, you long to put your hand in his or hers and have a word of fellowship while you come out of the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. No matter how good you are, what church you belong to, what creed you say, what prayers you make, unless you come out of the blood, you're still out of fellowship with God. Yeah. Wouldn't it be marvelous now if the whole group of us right here, some six or five or six hundred people or whatever's in this audience, all these people together this afternoon, we would one accord to come out right under the blood, just like we're under this roof here, yeah. under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, what do you think would take place right now? What do you think would take place? Mm-hmm. Why, there wouldn't be a feeble person among us in the next five minutes. Mm-hmm. Oh, my, the sinner sitting next to you would be so condemned he couldn't yeah, even stand longer. Mm-hmm. The Holy Spirit coming around. The waters of separation being poured out the gospel, preaching the Lord Jesus yeah. Christ and his supreme sacrifice. And the healing power pouring down through Calvary 
Why, we'd just have a marvelous time, wouldn't we? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing if we could all get in fellowship? How many like to be in that fellowship? Raise your hand. Now, listen, friends. I spoke some hard things this afternoon about organization. Now, it's not that I'm against organization. God knows that's the truth. I don't care about organization. But the thing is, when you think that organization is going to do something for you, it isn't. Amen. The blood of Jesus Christ is the only thing that can do something for you. Amen. That's true. And then when that blood comes into your heart, your whole mental conception is different because you think from here then. See? Here's where Christ comes to the heart, and your thoughts are positive. It isn't, well, Miss Jones said that she could go to dances, didn't bother her. See, you're thinking about Miss Jones. But when it's in the heart, you think about the uh, Lord Jesus, what he would do. See, your whole thoughts are back here again. And that's what we need today is this marvelous fellowship of the Lord Jesus Christ and God back in our midst talking to us. Now look. Now, if those stars are I was timing the other day in the observatory, just before close, I'll give you a thought. If those stars, they said it would take me like a traveling, I forget how many thousands of years for speed traveling at the speed of light, light traveling at that fast, to come to this earth. Thousands times, thousands times, thousands times, thousands of years for life traveling to get to this earth from one of those stars. And we can see 120 million years of life space, and beyond there is just as star as it is here. How long would it take an angel to get from there here? Now, if you speak of heaven or when we die, that we go off to a place somewhere where you can't even see up there. Can't you see that God has hid the glory from the natural eye? We are sitting here in heavenly places. Now the Holy Spirit is here. Now Christ is here. And the part that we receive when we go out of here, we go into another dimension, into a blessed place with the Lord Jesus Christ. And at the return of Christ in his physical body, coming back to earth, these spirits return back and pick up a brand new body again, and we live forever. Amen. 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 Oh, my. If people could get the idea right now of angels walking up and down their bowels, of Christ, the Son of God, moving around in the building. Oh, my. What a difference. You're in his presence. And when your spirit becomes so charged with that outside world, and just like a, a magnet or a crystal in a radio, and when that uh, gadget in there becomes so charged or magnetized to those words that's stretching out until it strikes it and makes them positive, the radio coming through the air, the words we can't hear them with our ears, then we can't pick it up. But that crystal in the radio picks it up. The television the same. It becomes positive. And when our intellectual faith comes down into the heart and it becomes so charged with the unseen world that every word of God becomes a positive truth. Amen. You see what I mean? When God says it, it echoes against you just like it does on that crystal in the radio. It makes it perfect. God said, I'm the Lord that heals thee. That settles it. Amen. Amen. That makes it real. Hallelujah. I'll be with thee even in the, to the end of the world. That makes it real. He's here now. Now, that's what it is where I'm taken in divine healing. When that angel of the Lord appeared that night, said, I'll be with you. Don't be afraid. What did he do? He said he'd show signs and wonders among the people. I questioned him. I said, I, they won't believe that. He said, it'll come to pass that you'll even know the very secrets of the heart. Tell him these things. And I question that. He referred it back to Christ. He said, I'll be with you. Then when I walk to the platform to stick people or something like that on those things, it becomes a positive thing. I believe it. I wish I could have faith right now to believe that every sick person in this building would be healed. Just like I have faith to know that he's standing right here. 
I wish I could have that type of faith. I wish each one of you could have it. But if our thoughts and our fellowship comes out from around the rims of the things that we see into the things that we don't see, then it becomes just as positive as the things we see or more positive. That's right. yes. May the Lord bless you while we bow our heads just a moment. Heavenly Father, oh, for the fellowship around the body of Christ, around the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Oh, how we love Him. How we appreciate His presence here Hallelujah. now. Hallelujah. The great Son of God, the resurrected one, whose words can never fail, written here in the Bible, that wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, I'll be in their midst. And he here. God, may every unbeliever that's unregenerated, never come through the blood, has just been going to church, still got tempers, still got habits of the world they're holding on to, intellectual faith, but never been washed and cleansed so they can have perfect fellowship. God grants this afternoon that right now on this very spot that every heart will be washed, made clean in the blood of the Lamb. They'll come into a fellowship that the night's healing service will produce the greatest meaning that's ever been held in this world. Grant it, Lord. Will you do it for the glory of God, we ask it. With our heads bowed, I wonder, with everyone praying, if you will. I know it's getting late. But look, friends, it's getting late in two ways. The day is far spent, Sunday afternoon this day, the first day of May. And the age is far spent, too. It's later than what we think it is. That's it. The coming of the Lord is near. Man's heart, you see this great civilization fall and sinking right now. Just look at this America. What a disgrace. Look what Jesus said in the last days like it was in Noah, to be given in marriage and then look at the divorce courts in America is greater than all the nations put together. Look at the immorality, look at the perversion of sex perverse of out in the west coast and all around. Thousands times thousands growing every year. That's right. Filth, dirty, That's right. ungodly. Taking the natural use of the body and being perverted into something. People with perverted minds. Man go out and carry on the way to do women wearing these little clothes out. They don't think they're wrong. Sure not. Their mind's perverted. The devil's got a hold of them. They don't know it. Ah, what a day. Are you under the blood, believer? If you're not, why let the Lord Jesus and I alone look at this? If there's someone you're honest in your heart and know and by the preaching of the word, you've become to believe this, that you are wrong. It's something in your heart tells you that you're wrong. If you still have these things, you desire those things. You don't, you don't necessarily have to do them, you just have the desire of them. He didn't look at the phone of woman to lust after her half committed her effort already in his heart. Not he to take the gun and shoot his brother but the angry with him without a car. If you know you're wrong, would you raise your hand and say, Brother Ben, pray for me now. I pray that God will bring me under the blood and give me an old-fashioned experience in my heart be clean before God. If that person's in here, would you raise your hand just now before we have prayer and say, just to raise your hand, not to me, but to God. Thank God be merciful to me now. I want a real clean heart before you. Is that for you? One thousand. God bless you. God bless you. You. God bless you, lady. God bless you, lady. God bless you, sir. God bless you, my brother. God bless you, my sister. That's good. And God bless you, my brother. That's God. Be honest with God. Now, it's not, not me. You're not raising your hand to me to God. God bless you, lady. I see you back there. Someone else say, God bless you, lady. You, sir. You, sir. God bless you. You, sir. That's the way to be honest. That's the way to be men and women. We're before God. God bless you, lady. You won't have anything taken out of your life. Sure, God is going to do it. Only thing you have to do is let him do it now. Is there another before prayer? While we have our heads down, dear God, oh, Father, those human souls, we realize, Lord, that in the building here is the one who will judge us that day. Not even a sparrow can fall to the street without the Father knowing it. 
How much more do you know these people raising their hands in sincerity, sitting here in this long wee hours of the afternoon, listening to the Word? I pray, God, that you'll cleanse every heart just now with the blood of the Lord Jesus. May every habit, every sin of a, oppression or anything that's wrong with these dear people, God, I pray that you will take it away from them just now. Right. May they become humble and sweet Christians, hating iniquity and loving righteousness. Grant it, God. Oh, blessed Savior God, man. Now, Father, may every person here receive great faith just now. We're looking forward to the night service, Lord, for the healing of the sick. Oh, will you just once more, Lord, one more time let it happen. The evil of our brothers going away overseas, that he might go with a fresh vision in his heart to see the kingdom of God brought before the children of man. May this be a wonderful service tonight. May every sick person who comes into the door of Christ be made perfectly well. Will you grant it, Lord? Heal those who are in the soul and body. While we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. It's been quite a few days. Been home, had lots of troubles and things. You know how it is around home. We're up night before last until break of day. Come in, out all yesterday. Last night just a very little sleep. And up this morning and up here. <laughs> I rough. I've kept you a long time. I'm sorry I've kept you all that long. I hope you, it's the Holy Spirit. I've noticed. I want to say this. If I go give you a little bit of growth but now, then a whole read back years on. I've never. I've had good audiences around the world, but I've never had a more attentive and uh, audience than I have here in this little church here in Chicago. You people around here. I know it's this afternoon. I had on my heart, when it comes to the platform, to speak on something else. Really, the Holy Spirit was telling me to do it on the Ark of the Covenant, what I was going to speak on. And when I walked to the platform up here, I thought fellowship would be a good thing to speak. I've done something that crossed up myself towards the Holy Spirit and told me not to do it. I tried to battle on you. Let me tell you something. Like what I said about Brother Joseph a few minutes ago, when I'm wrong, right or wrong. So did you. There hasn't been a person that can leave this building in this afternoon. All this time I have to be sitting here, all that time knowing that the healing service is coming on, and many of you have to go home and eat supper, you sat right here with me. That's your heart. I love you. I take you before God. And you stuck right by when you see me even battling. See, that's what I mean when I'm in the wrong sometimes. See? When I'm in the wrong. Now, I pray that God will give you everything that you have need of, every desire of your heart. And maybe, how many here wants to be healed tonight? Raise your hand. Just everybody in the God bless you. Oh, my, may His grace be with you. Now, if you have to go home, won't you go and rest up a little bit? Come back about, after a while, pick you up a prayer card. Come on up tonight and be prayed for. I just believe we're going to have a wonderful meeting, don't you? Amen. God bless you. I turn the service out of the I've seen about a couple of hours.